and some of the physics that the universe went or originated in something we call a Big Bang. The Big Bang happened a finite time ago. Okay. Actually, we know, we can calculate that now. It's 14 billion years, more or less, 14,000 million years. But um, so that's where we are. And I was trying to motivate at the end, why is there, why was there a Big Bang? And where we left it is that the Big Bang is what gives a sense to the notion of time. That is why we get old. We get old because something breaks the symmetry in, the, in, the, in physics, which is uh, the symmetry of time. So we actually have an arrow of time in our universe because the universe is expanding. That's kind of in a where we left it. Okay, so what I'll try to do next is to go through the second part is to convince you that what we learned by studying cosmology or the universe as a whole uh, has convinced us that there, that there is a big paradox, or what I call it a nightmare for physics, in the sense that what we know about matter in the universe apparently uh, does not apply to the universe as a whole, or the matter that, that we understand is a tiny fraction of it. And what we know about energy is not the energy that dominates the universe. It's something else as well. That's where we're going. That's where we're going next. Okay. Okay. So let's continue on this on these ideas. Um, so we go back in time. I told you. So we're expanding. Tomorrow's the universe is getting bigger. Going back in time, the universe becomes very, 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 very dense. Okay. It's very, very dense and very, very hot. Okay. So let's have a little inventory of the matter in our universe. In our solar system. Universe have actually gone and touch and explore, you know, by, by going and retrieving things and coming back, meteorites, asteroids, planets, whatever. What we learn is that if you were to put all the things that we know in the solar system together, right? We just put them all in a bag, all the atoms, we talked about that too, all the atoms in the solar system in a bag, all the planets, all the asteroids, all the Jupiter and all the stuff, put all in a bag, all the atoms, shake it around. Okay, like in Lotto 649 or whatever, and grab one atom and look at it. And then grab another one and you look at it. And grab another one and you look at it. When you do that, what you find is that basically it's all hydrogen. The universe, a little bit of helium too, but it doesn't change the story. The universe is basically hydrogen and almost nothing else. The rest is really kind of irrelevant. We are not made of hydrogen. <laughs> We're, I guess at least I'm not made of hydrogen. I think maybe some of you are, but I mean, hydrogen is combustible. That's why, that's the joke, okay? So, but um, like I'm not made of hydrogen. We're made of, you know, iron and carbon and all those things. Where does that stuff come from? Why is it such a tiny fraction of what is in the universe? We can learn about that because we can go and say, well, how much carbon there is, how much oxygen there is, how much manganese there is, magnesium, etc. And the only way you can make sense of these ratios, why is this, this carbon, this helium, this magnesium, etc. The only way to make sense of this is by appealing to the notion that all the atoms that are no hydrogen were formed in the center of stars, like the sun. Stars are what makes us possible. All the carbon, every atom of carbon in your body, every atom of oxygen in your body, every atom, all of those nuclei were once in the center of a star. Okay? This is what we say, we are stardust. Those stars exploded and those atoms were spread through the universe and they collided again, collapsed into the planet, and there you are. You came out of that. Okay? But all the nuclei were once in the center, all of us were once in the center of a star. That's interesting. And why is that? Well, because we know a star like this is hot because of nuclear fusion. It is taking hydrogen, turning into helium, helium turns into carbon, etc. Blah, blah. That's interesting. So stars do this. But I just told you the universe is hydrogen and basically nothing else. And let's put the two things together. Let's go back in time when the universe itself becomes hot and dense. It becomes like a star. This star is hot and dense. 
the universe close to the Big Bang, all the universe was like a big star. And yet, it didn't turn hydrogen into helium and carbon and oxygen. Why? Why is the beginning of the universe very close to the Big Bang not a star, not a nuclear reactor? Why not? There must be a reason for that. My reason that we can understand. And the reason for that is that the universe is made of, it's what, well, it's has something else, has light, as I told you. And the way that, um, sorry, this is, this is what I just told you in, in words, okay? I'm just gonna go in this a bit, uh, a bit behind in the, the way that this, the universe avoids being a nuclear reactant early on is because of this. This is the way you do it. Remember that all we had was protons and neutrons and basically nothing else. The proton and neutron, you fuse them together, you create deuterium, you fuse them together and you create helium. Okay? And then you go on. But this is the weak link of the chain. You have to form deuterium. And this deuterium is very fragile. Deuterium can be destroyed by colliding it with photons, with light. So you form deuterium, and if there is enough light, this like gamma rays appear here, there are many, many gamma rays. This immediately gets fused together with this and broken, broken up. You see, things that happen one way can happen the other way. So if there's enough of these gamma rays here, this can never progress and it sticks together. And we can make the numbers. How many of these gamma things we need in order for nuclear fusion never to go past this. And the number is uh, calculable. I should do that calculation. And it's staggering. We need about a billion of each of these gamma, point, gamma rays per proton. One billion. So the universe is full of light. And that is the difference between a star, the center of a star, and the early universe. A center of a star, although it has lots of light, it doesn't have a billion, it has a couple of million, often a factor of thousands. The difference then is light. The universe is so full of light that it can't go beyond the theory. Okay. So where is this light? Where is this light in the universe? Where is this light? Okay. Well, let's, before, we, before I tell you that, let me tell you what we can measure, okay? We can measure, for example, how much deuterium will, I will form. You see, the amount of deuterium I form will depend on how many protons per photon I have, right? This is the ratio of protons per photon. It doesn't matter the numbers. And this is the deuterium that I produce, this line, the blue line here. This we can measure. We can measure how much deuterium there is in the universe. If you can measure how much deuterium there is in the universe, I can measure how much, how many protons I have per photon. See, protons per photon, this is what I measure, and this is the deuterium. Measuring deuterium left over from the Big Bang tells me how many protons and photons I have. Actually, the ratio between the two. And the trick that we'll do is that if I can measure how many photons I know I have, then I can know how many protons I have because I know the ratio. So that's the trick that we're going to be playing. So where is this, where is this cosmic light, as I call it, that is prevented in the early Big Bang, this progression from, from hydrogen to heavier elements? Okay. Where, where, where is this? And, um, and just to tell you, to give you a visual impression again, of where can we see this light? Let's think about, again, about the universe and this uniform kind of homogeneous universe that as we, look, as we look back in time, hypothetically, contracts and gets hotter and denser. Okay? This is the example I gave you before. Think of a homogeneous universe as basically a grid that is contracting or expanding. And though, without changing shapes, so all this changing is the size of the grid. So as it changes, as it expands, but everywhere it changes the same. Okay? So there's no center to this expansion. Only contraction, 
Like when you contract it, there's no center of that contraction either. Every, every piece is contracting at the same rate. Since the contraction and expansion are just leave the shape of the grid alone, what we do in cosmology is say, okay, well, the grid hasn't changed. And I just say, oh, look, I just give a number to this size and that quantifies the expansion or contraction. But as we go back in time, the universe comes down. So what's happening really, if I leave the grid alone and I go back in time, it's equivalent to saying, look, now per grid point, there, is there one galaxy, there are four galaxies, 10 galaxies. Or, or maybe even more, there are thousands of galaxies in just one grid point. This is the same as go back in time. So you go back in time, we can think of the size becoming smaller or the density at each point becoming bigger. Okay. Now what happens when density becomes bigger? We see we have light in the universe, we have photons and we have hydrogen, I told you. As you go back in time, the, each point is becoming very dense. It turns out that as a hydrogen, remember what hydrogen was, a proton and an electron. The electron is married to the proton. It's going around in like in a circle, if you remember your, yeah, it's not true, but they're, they're together, it's all right? When a, an electron is close to the proton and it orbits around it, it has a particular property. It doesn't like light. It doesn't like light. A, a, a neutral hydrogen atom is very transparent. You can shine light through it and it goes through. It's not true for every light. So you have spectral lines and stuff. It doesn't really matter. But it's basically transparent. Now, when you go back to this time where the universe is very dense and very hot, hot means that the things are moving very fast. Dense means they're very close together. So they start colliding. The atoms of hydrogen collide. And as they collide, the energy of the collisions is enough to grab the electrons and move them out. They're not married to the protons anymore. And these electrons, when they're free, they actually turn themselves into something else. It's like being young and single and being married. When you're married, you don't mess with photons. Light is not for you. When you're single, wow, electrons love photons. They're amazing. They love photons. Every photon they see, they grab and they expel it. They collide with it. Their cross-section for scattering, if you want big names, is huge. Free electrons, which is what happens when the universe is dense and hot, basically create a fog. Light can propagate because it's free. All these free electrons are everywhere. So they go, light goes from here to there to there, they go both back and forth, back and forth. You can't go anywhere. Light basically is trapped. Every photon, every thing is just going around here in a little merry-go-round from one place to another. We say that the universe is opaque. Light cannot go from here to here. Light sticks there. So the early universe is a opaque universe. <laughs> now let's imagine this running the, the movie forward in time rather than backwards. The universe is opaque. As the universe becomes bigger and bigger, the density drops. At some point, the electrons marry the protons again. And they say, oh no, I, I can't mess around with photons anymore. <laughs> I'm married here, hey? And the photons escape. The photons can now propagate freely. And since what, what happens here, the same happens everywhere, the whole universe becomes transparent at the same time. And light that was here starts propagating that way, this way, this way, everywhere. But everywhere is the same. So from here, light propagates every and every direction, from here in every direction, here in every direction, etc. So this is, so what do you see then? You're here, imagine you put yourself at some point in this grid, doesn't really matter where it is. All the points are equivalent. So what you see after a while is that the light, photons go this way, that way. One of the photons would come to your direction and you receive it today. But another photon at the same time that comes to your direction, you receive it from that other direction and this other direction, etc. So you see, you see bombarded yourself with photons, with light coming from everywhere, from every direction. We're bombarded by these billions of photons per proton today. So in other words, if you had a telescope and it's in the right frequency, turns out this actually is in the radio frequencies, microwaves, and you point it in every direction, you always find the same. You always measure exactly the same. 
we are surrounded by a, a background of light that we call the cosmic microwave background. Okay, and it all comes from that moment, the moment the universe become, became transparent. Okay, so this is the picture you might have. This is the, we're surrounded by the sphere. We cannot see further than that, you see? This is our final frontier. We can't see further than that because beyond that, the universe was opaque. So although there may be things beyond this, I cannot see them. I can only collect information from this sphere inwards. So this um, final frontier, as I call it, is the, the moment basically when the universe became transparent, okay? This was actually discovered, of course, in the 60s by Arno Penzias and uh, Robert Wilson, who awarded the Nobel Prize for this discovery in the 70s. And one thing we learned about this is that the light that we receive is what we call a perfect black body. A black body is not what a black body is <laughs> for uh, people in the general. <laughs> But a black body for physicists is how a, an opaque body emits energy. An opaque body for us is a black body. I should change the name here. It's a bit dated, I guess. But it is what we call a black body. And it has a very particular kind of spectrum. It's called the Planck curve. It doesn't matter. All the things doesn't, don't matter the details. But it has this curve. It goes up and down like this. And believe it or not, this is not a theory curve. This is data. This actually, the measurement of this has led to another Nobel Prize in 2006, the measurement of this spectrum of the micro background, as we call it. And because it's a perfect black body, we know that the universe was opaque. It was opaque. So this stuff I'm telling you actually did really happen. And because of that, we also can count. We know how many, see if this is light, we can count how many photons there are. Because I just, I'm receiving them all the time, so I know how many photons there are. But if I know how many photons there are, remember, and I know the deuterium abundance, I know how many protons there are. Because I know the ratio of the two. And that way I know how much matter there is in the universe. I can do that calculation. I can deduce how much matter there is by measuring the number of photons, knowing the ratio of photons to proton, and just do the, do the inverse. So by observing the micro background directly, I measured how many atoms the universe has, how many protons there are in the universe, how much matter there is in the universe. Because hydrogen, as I told you, is basically all there is. We go beyond that, okay. and we can do the following. This is the micro background. This is a picture of the sky, and this is what we call the temperature of the micro background. It doesn't really matter exactly. But you see, it's very uniform. Everywhere, the universe appears to shine in this light, which is the same from everywhere, which is what we expected. The universe was homogeneous and uniform, as, we, as I told you at the beginning. So it seems very, very nice. Is there information here? And, you know, physicists are like dentists. So you go to the dentist and say, oh, how is your teeth doing? And you say, they're fine. I say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, then they get this thing, like, and they start, like, you know, grabbing at your thing with, like, this harpoon or whatever it is that they use. Oh, horrible. And they always find some things, right? Because if you mess around with something enough, something will appear, right? So that's kind of, a, it's in the Bible, I think. Not that I'm very religious, but say the Bible, if you look for trouble, you'll find it. Okay? That's, and I think yeah. it's... It's not, it's, it's, a, it's not a direct quote, but it's the, the sentiment is there. So what do you do here? You have all these photons, which are apparently all the same. What you can do is take differences, differences from that black body. Is it really exactly a black body? And the answer is no. If you look at tiny differences, and these differences are now hugely expanded. These are like little fluctuations, but the differences are tiny, right? There's one in 100,000. So measurements like this are very difficult to make. This is what you see. The universe, these photons that are coming from everywhere are evidence that the universe was not exactly 
homogeneous. It was very, very, very close to homogeneous, but not exactly homogeneous. You see some places are hot, red, some places are cold, blue, colder than the average. So the average is almost perfect, but not exactly perfect. And believe it or not, these little fluctuations in the universe at the time are the origin of everything you see in the universe. Every planet, every galaxy, every cluster of galaxies, everything comes from these little fluctuations. If the universe had been exactly homogeneous, it would have remained always exactly homogeneous. Where do these fluctuations come from? Why are that? Why are the way they are? Why are they so small? We don't have answers to the, all of these things, but there's some answer. We have answer for some things. Like for example, you see from here, so it's amazing. This is a picture of, let's say, like a sonogram of a baby universe, right? This is, look at this here. Do you see this little curvy thing like that? You see that? Looks like an S, you said. Do you see this other thing here? Two bars and one bar like that? Looks like an H, doesn't it? It's like there's a signature here of who was around at the time that this universe was created. And the initials are SH. I think it's Stephen Harper, <laughs> whose, whose, whose government actually closed the center of the universe, if you remember correctly, when you go to vote, right? Whose government said, oh, the center of the universe is not, in, it's not interesting, and cut off the budget to zero, right? So remember that. He was already there, so right? <laughs> that is a joke, of course, but this is actually true, and nobody understands why. You know, and people can find A. I found my own J, I found my own name, so maybe I was around there. Maybe you can find your own name, too. I mean, I don't know. But this is interesting. But actually, it's more interesting than that, because there's something peculiar about this map. You see, there seem to be a characteristic scale here. You see the little dot, red dots, this, this one, this one, this one, this one, they all seem to have kind of the same size, doesn't it? And this one, this one, kind of the same size. They're not bigger than that, they're not smaller than that. So why is that? Why is there a characteristic size in this map of the universe as it was at the time that the universe became transparent? This is what we call the sound horizon. There's a big names we say. But it really comes from a simple fact. is the age of the universe times the speed of light. The speed of light is constant, always was constant. The age of the universe at this time, we know it. And that gives you a size. And that's a characteristic size that creates a pattern in this map. So I know how big these little blobs are in kilometers and meters and whatever. I know they're this big. But they appear like that on the sky. This is an angle on the sky. See, if I know the distance to this, I should be able to tell you know, how far away they are. Actually, we know the distance too. I know how big they are. I know the angle because I measure it. And I know how far away they are. Remember trigonometry in school? You had to say, oh, I measure the angle, I had to see how high the building was, and you failed the SAT. That's a, that's, <laughs> that is what you use here. So with two, you can get, figure out the third one, all right? So if you know the distance and the angle, you can figure out how high it was, or if you know the height and the angle, you can figure out the distance, etc. You need two, get three. Here, we measure three. We measure three of them. I measure the angle, the distance, and the size. What is that telling me? Something very interesting. It tells me how light propagates to the universe. You see, if light propagates like this, the angle, the size, and the distance are related in the way you expect it. This is what we call Euclidean geometry, where the sum of three triangles gives you always angles in a triangle, you see 180. But it doesn't have to be that way. Remember, the universe could be curved. I told you before, it could be curved. Gravity curves matter, space time. So it could be like this. The angle could be different or like this. So we can actually, by measuring these things, I can tell you how the universe is curved. And it turns out the answer is this one. The answer, overall, the curvature of the universe seems to be zero. 
is flat, like a pancake. Light rays that are parallel remain parallel. So that's actually quite interesting. Why? Because the curvature of the universe, curvature of space-time, tells me how much matter there is. Remember, matter curves space-time. If I can measure the curvature of space-time, I know how much matter there is. Actually, matter and energy curve space-time. But I can, I, can, I can do this. I know the geometry of the universe. I know how much matter and energy there are in the universe. And this is what we, this is what we do. We infer from the geometry of the universe how much matter and energy there is. And this is what we have been able to, been able to figure out. Okay? I've been able to figure out the total amount of matter and energy because of the curvature. But I also was able to figure out the total amount of matter because I measure the amount of photons and I know the ratio of photons to protons. So I measure the total amount of matter energy, I measure the total amount of matter, I measure the total amount of energy. So then I can do, it's called accounting, if you're remembering in high school. This should be equal to this plus that, right? Yeah. And when we do the calculation, you know, it's the same accounting as, uh, Nortel had. Do you have Nortel? Do you lose money in Nortel when you when you went under? The big Canadian company went bankrupt. Okay, the accounting was a bit fluffy, as they say. Okay. Um, when you add all that, add the total amount of matter we know, the total amount of energy we know, I compare the total amount of everything, the total amount of everything is this pie chart, you get about this thing here. A little wedge. All that we know in the universe, all the matter energy that we know, makes a tiny wedge in the total. There's something else in the universe that's curving the universe in a particular way, that's making it expand in a particular way, that is not the matter, the matter that we understand, and it's not the energy that we understand. What is it? It's a bit more complicated. For matter, we have some clues. We call this dark matter. We know that there's another form of matter that appears when you look at the gravity in a galaxy by measuring how fast stars spin around. There's another form of matter. We're able to measure that. We know how much matter, dark matter there is per galaxy. So we can they say, okay, how much dark matter there is in the universe? It turns out it makes about 20%, 30% of all the matter energy. This dark matter is actually dominant in galaxies, in our own galaxy as well. This is a model of a galaxy, of our galaxy. Our galaxy is this thing here, the yellow thing. This is all the stars in the Milky Way. And this is the dark matter halo, as we call it, in which the galaxy is surrounded. Okay. So we have been able to figure out this. This is the matter energy that we understand. This is the dark matter. What is this other thing here? How do we figure this, this one out? Well, the way we try to figure this out is by looking at how the universe expands. Okay. I told you the universe is expanding. And how we figure that, that out? We figure out because the, the Doppler shift, as we say, of galaxies, we take a spectrum, we look at lines, and these lines appear shifted, always to the red. Okay, we call this the red shift. So these galaxies are all red shifted, and we can figure this out. We can figure out, you know, what is this telling us? What I mentioned the red shift is telling me how much the universe has expanded since the time the light was emitted. Now we can combine that measurement. What, what we need, we'd like to, to, to reconstruct the expansion history of the universe. We need to know how long ago did had this happened. By measuring the red shift, we can figure out how much smaller the universe was, say, when the light was emitted, but how long ago did that happen? I don't know that. Could it happen very early on or much later? We can figure that, that, that out by looking at supernovae. Because you see, supernovae are a particular kind of supernova emits always the same amount of light. So you can measure supernova since it emits the same amount of light, and I can measure how much light I receive. I, and light can only go one way, Right, it only expands away. The, if it's bright, it's because it's very close. The event, this happened relatively re recently. If it's very faint, it happened a long time ago. Okay. And I can use the combination of the two. 
how much the universe has expanded and how much the supernova has dimmed, but to actually to measure the expansion of the universe, how the universe has been expanded in time by looking at different supernova in different galaxies at different times in the universe. If I do that, this is what you get. Okay, you get, we're here, this is time, this is size, and this is what you find. We, this is the back, you know, in the back, going back in time, this is where you have. So you go on, you see on this green line here, very close to this green line over here. This green line is a theoretical line, because all the, all the points here, and it tells you that we started expanding about 14 billion years ago. So I told you. But it tells you something more interesting. It tells you what happened in the future. In the future, the green line goes like that. It goes like the COVID curve again. It tells us that the universe today is expanding faster than before. You see the curvature like this tells you how it can expand. If it goes like this, it's decelerating. If it goes like that, it's accelerating. You see, it's kind of switching gears, the universe, today, from decelerating, curving like that, to accelerating, curving up. And this is a signature of what is that other energy, the other part of the universe that we were missing. We don't know what it is, but we know it acts in a different way to gravity. If it's going to make the universe expand faster and faster, it must be a repulsive force. So galaxies that are far away are actually attracting each other with the force of gravity, but repelling each other with the force of else, whatever this thing is. I call it the force that keeps Shakira and I separated. But you know, Shak you know Shakira? Do you know Shakira? You don't know Shakira. I know Shakira. Is hips don't lie and stuff? Yeah? True? She's from Colombia. So I, we're kind of neighbors. I'm from Argentina originally. But. Anyway, I've never met her, but it's hair loss. In the middle. But anyway, going back to, <laughs> to this. Um, so now we know this is a repulsive force. It's a repulsive force in the universe that has nothing to do with any other force that we ever understood. Right? And it deserves a big name, and that's what we call it Energia Oscura. Actually, we call it dark energy, but this is in Spanish. I guess I forgot to translate this particular. Yeah, we call it dark energy, just to make it sound very... What is this dark energy? I will come to the end, don't worry. Well, the short answer is that we don't know, okay? We think, I mean, what's hard, what is... It means that it kind of gives us the impression that as the universe becomes bigger, something else is being added to it. But what is the thing that gets added as the universe becomes bigger? If I, you and I, or any other one, just to separate, what, what becomes bigger is our distance. So we are separated by bigger distances. And the distance contains vacuum. There's more vacuum between you and I if we separate. So as the universe becomes bigger, more vacuum gets into the universe. But vacuum is nothing, is that right? Vacuum is nothing, it should be fairly benign, you say. It turns out in physics, that's not the case. In physics, we have something called the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, very brainy thing. So all that tells you is that you cannot know for certain at the level of quantum mechanics, some things. So if you say, oh, the vacuum is zero, there's no energy, you, Quant a quantum person will ask you, are you sure? Because if you're sure that it's zero, then you're violating the uncertainty principle. You cannot know for sure. So vacuum in quantum mechanics is not zero. It's not nothing. It's a cancellation. A cancellation of things that appear and disappear. They appear and disappear. They appear, annihilate and create. Annihilate and create. Particles appear from nowhere and disappear all the time. And believe it or not, we measure this. I'm not making this up, I'm not totally crazy. We measure, we have experiments to measure how much energy there is in the vacuum, in nothing. That's not a lot, <laughs> so thankfully, but it is there. And 
when the universe becomes bigger, there's more of that vacuum, more of that thing that appears there. And if that's true, then you should act like a repulsive force, a force that makes the universe want to expand faster and faster all the time. Okay. So that is the best, it's not very good, admittedly, but it's the best explanation that we have for what is three quarters of the matter energy density of the universe. Okay. <laughs> is an energy that we don't understand that has nothing to do with energy light. There's only other energy that we understand in, in physics. And uh, that apparently dominates the expansion of the universe today. And it will lead the universe to expand faster and faster ever. Okay. So apparently not. At least not if you include this particular term. There may be other term. So this is my conclusion. Neither the matter that dominates the universe is Oh, uni universities. Okay, that's, that's called a typo, okay? <laughs> the universe's gravity is the matter we know, nor the energy that determines the universe's fate is what we thought it was. Okay, and this is the nightmare for physics that we discover when we apply the best observations and the best theories we have to cosmology, to the universe as a whole. Okay, so the universe is made of this dark matter, we don't know what it is, what we know is not any of the matter that, we, that, we, that I told you, the, the periodic table. Dark energy, which is not the energy to understand. So we figured this out so far, the little wedge here. It's not a lot, I must say, but we've been able to put names, put names to things we don't understand. It's like having two kids. Right? You give them names, but do you understand them? No. Do you understand them? Often, often. Yeah, let's, give it, yeah, let's, not, let's not get into familiar trifles here. <laughs> But this is it, right? So we, I've been able to name these things and figure out how they work. And the best minds in physics and in astronomy are after these two things. What are they? What is it made of? Is there a particle? Is there a particle that we're missing in the periodic table? Is there like another kind of quark? Is there another kind of whatever? What is this dark energy? For this, at least for this, we have some ideas. For this, we have zero ideas. But the only idea we have that's credible, the one I gave you, which is not very good, but as it is what it is. So the, I said that four unsolved problems in the universe, dark matter, dark energy, the origin of Velcro that nobody has, nobody has ever been able to explain to me. You know Velcro? The stuff that's sticky and you know, you, you know about Velcro, is right? You just shoe or something, you put some, but the Velcro is weird because you look at Velcro and said, this cannot possibly stick, all right? And you put it together and it sticks. It's amazing. But then you wait a year or so, and then you say, this should stick. And you put it and it doesn't stick anymore. So what happened? It's crazy. I don't know. Velcro? Nobody knows about Velcro. That's the third. <laughs> and the other, the other one is the, the original. Do you know what this, this is? What is this? It's a dust ball. You look under your bed, go home, <laughs> look under your bed and say, oh. <laughs> Professor Navarro was correct, right? The original dust ball, nobody knows this. Nobody knows. Like, I don't know. You can put, you know, you can close your windows, your doors, you know, hermetically, do a vacuum in your room, vacuum your room for, no, do a real vacuum, like, you know, vacuum that has energy and stuff. Vacuum, and then go back a month later, open the door, look under the bed, there it is. It's right there. It's right there. It's, there's, there's a dust ball. I mean, when they, when they vacated the International Space Station, you know, they, they vacated it. Yeah, they had to, they didn't have Soyuz capsules to go on back and forth, whatever. It was like six months on its own, nobody there. And then they went, Russian astronauts or whatever arrived. First thing they looked, under the bed. And guess what? It was a last ball. In space, in the middle of nowhere. So, I think they come out of a vacuum of nothing, okay? That's the fourth unsolved uh, mystery of the universe. And I'm sure there are others if you care enough. Uh, but thanks so much for joining me. Uh, it's a pleasure, of course. I hope the, this little tour of uh, understanding of the galaxy and the universe has been good. I was, I'll repeat what I tell my students. I actually have two former students here. Sarah, the thing I say in my class is, if you can listen to me speak 
and you're still interested in astronomy, it means your vocation is genuine. Okay, so at least this is, you know, they passed. Maybe some of you will pass as well. Thank you. Thanks so much. There you go.